feature presentation. What's up, everybody? Welcome to a very special mini episode of the Untitled Movie Podcast. I am one of your hosts, Matt Rohrbeck, usually. But today, we have a very special interview between Eric Marchin and Jay Cheel. You guys might know Jay from the longest-running film podcast on the internet. Yes, it's a Guinness World Record film junk. You should check it out. But he is also a filmmaker. He's directed movies like Beauty Day and How to Build a Time Machine. And he also has cursed films on Shudder, which you guys should check out. Season two just started. The first couple episodes are up. So please go check those out. And then please enjoy this interview between Eric and Jay. Eric. Jay, how are you? Good. How are you? Well, are you, are you still I, I, riding high off of your X-Men viral uh, tweet? Oh, yes. You know, it. <laughs> um, I have to say, though, um, full transparency right up front. Um a couple hours ago, I tested positive for COVID and I'm starting to kind of feel like that, oh. you know, that initial kind of wave of fatigue and, and achiness. Yeah, so yeah. I apologize if I'm less lucid. And the last time I talked okay. to you, it That's was the okay. first Zoom interview that I did. So I feel like both right. of these interviews are weirdly <laughs> cursed. <laughs> it, it makes sense. I mean, curses are now following me and everyone I talk to. So. <laughs> Um, on that note, I just wanted to um, thank you for taking the time to talk to me. And I wanted to first ask just about the title, Cursed Films 2. Uh, you know, like you look at a lot of TV series and, and whether they be episodic or miniseries, they usually are kind of, you know, season one or, or you know, just the, the cursed films. But you decided to go with Cursed Films 2. Was, what was the reasoning behind that? And was that always the intention? Um, so I, I think there's kind of two reasons. One is I just love the look of a Roman numeral two beside the title. <laughs> um, but also I, I feel like the second season is a little bit different from the first in that everything we cover in the first with the over, like the, the idea of covering why we want to believe in curses, why we want to make these connections, the idea of ma magical thinking, coincidence, synchronicity, all of the, the things that the critical analysis of, you know, uh, why these stories are per perpetuated and told over and over again. We kind of did that in the first season. So I'm hoping that season one almost works as a primer for season two and that you just carry that with you into this season. So we don't have to just keep repeating that, you know, this is a coincidence and you you like coincidences because you have this primal thing in your mind that makes you look for patterns. So I, I think it separates it out a little bit in that way as well, that this is kind of like, it's five separate documentaries that are as close as we can get, get to definitive tell, ret uh, tellings of these stories. And I think they work on their own, you know, as, as great little individual films. So that's kind of the the idea. I mean, re really, it's just the cool Roman numeral. But... Right. I mean, it does look really cool. I have to admit yeah, that. Yeah. Um, but going back to season one, there is a, a, an episode where one of the interviewees talks about you know, horror films having a certain air to them when they're considered cursed or have this legend. But then this, you know, there's also conversations about other movies that aren't necessarily, you know, horror films that also have this mythos. When you were choosing the films to sort of dig deep into the the mythos and the called so-called curse, was it always the, the consideration there to do something outside of uh, horror movies specifically? I don't think it was a like a specific consideration, but I I was kind of interested in it. You know, like we we do talk about how the cursed nature of these films seems to be in line with the subject matter of the films. So you know, if you make a movie about Satan, are you opening up these dark energies to come in and you know haunt your set or or whatever? Um, but the the idea of I, uh, I think just as interesting as that is the idea of the contrast of a film that's intended to bring joy and, you know, just purely entertain people like The Wizard of Oz, the most sort of accessible, popular film of all time, having dark stories connected to it. It's the contrast of that that I think makes it appealing and makes people want to tell those stories over and over. So that was kind of a, a nice, fresh angle, at least for that episode, um, to take in terms of the idea of a cursed film. 
was there an order this time around that you kind of wanted to to follow? Because I know, again, like last time talking to you, you mentioned that there was kind of an order that you had planned before it initially aired. And so I was wondering if there was a structure or a thematic sort of underlining uh, with the show. Yeah, I, I think not not as much as the first season, but I really just wanted to bookend it with Wizard of Oz and Cannibal Holocaust. Because <laughs> <laughs> one, it's just an insane bookend. Yeah. But also there are some things that are brought up in Wizard of Oz that I think kind of like thematic things that are paid off a little bit in Cannibal Holocaust. Um, in, in regards to like the blurring the lines of what's real and what isn't and cannibal Holocaust kind of uh, breaking the contract with the audience, you know, suggesting that everything you're going to see is fake. This is a movie, but as soon as you see an animal killed, then you're like, well, if they're killing animals, what else are they doing? So that blurring of that line, I think can apply to, a lot of the stories that came in our episodes before Cannibal Holocaust, and even in terms of documentary filmmaking, you know, some techniques used to tell these stories. Um, and just, just even on that level of, you know, like something being considered high art and low art as well. And, you know, The Wizard yeah. of Oz, as you mentioned, being a classic movie that so many people love and Cannibal Holocaust being very notorious. I remember you talking on Film Junk, you know, I think you played it for like HMV customers or something you mentioned at one point. No. Oh, did I? Maybe I did. I, I do remember uh, when I worked at a video game company, Silicon Knights, we had a movie night. And someone recommended we watch it, and that person didn't show up to the screening. <laughs> right. <laughs> so we all watched it, and we're just like, felt really gross afterwards. Yeah. Um, but yeah, it's 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 a uh, it's not a movie I would recommend. Um, not not because of the I think it has qualities to it. it. Like there's some value there, but I don't really want to watch it again. And I wouldn't blindly recommend it to someone. You know, to say like. The, there's value here, you know, just look past all the horrific stuff and, you know, focus on the way in which it plays with the framing narrative. <laughs> like, right. It, yeah, it, like the found footage documentary. Yeah, kind of style, I mean, right? it's, it's true. It, it does that in a really interesting way, but you have to work past a lot of stuff to get to that appreciation, I think. Yeah. Uh, I saw it because you were talking about it on Film Junk, and that scene with the tortoise will be forever burned in my brain. So I'm kind of dreading that last episode. Um, and it's not it, we've we've tried to make it as you know, uh, it's not an easy episode. <laughs> there's it, it's there's a lot of uh, discussions that will make people uncomfortable. Um, and in the same way as Wizard of Oz does, like that's where they kind of are similar as well. This idea of reckoning with the past, like this, the looking back at a, a beloved film in, in the case of the Wizard of Oz and trying to, you know, uh, 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 figure out how these dark stories slot, like uh, intersect with this film that is so beloved and do these stories at all affect the legacy of the film? And I mean, in the Wizard of Oz episode, this is partly why I love the Steve Rash section. He directed a film called Under the Rainbow. And Son-in-Law. And, and Son-in-Law. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, uh, we interviewed him. And initially, it was just going to be like, let's talk about Under the Rainbow, because this film kind of perpetuated the idea that the munchkins were all party animals. But when we met up with him, he had watched the film for the first time in 20 years and was just like mortified, <laughs> you know, like was not, um, was not thrilled with the choices that they made at that time uh, and the way in which they told that story. And it was just such an interesting sort of um, reckoning with his own past, you know, on camera. Right. And watching him so effortless, effortlessly suggest that they made a lot of mistakes up against Oz historians really having a hard time rationalizing what happened but and, and wanting to protect the legacy of Oz and Judy by, you know, 
saying it was 80 years ago, times were different. And that's true. It was time, times were different, but it still happened. You know, it's still, it's still this weird dark element of the making of that film that you have to, you have to reckon with. Right. And, and speaking of, of Steve Rash, there's, there are moments when he's talking to you that it looks like he is going to break down. It's very remorseful for his part in, in, in making that film. When you are talking to subjects on camera, you always seem to have a way that opens people up very naturally and organically and having just genuine conversations. And a conversation, again, you had on Film Junk, and please, you know, tell me to stop because I don't want to come off as insensitive, but I just wanted to ask you, you know, you had a personal loss in, in your life um, not too long ago, and you talked about it very openly. Did it change your perspective on the series or how you interview certain subjects, especially ones that are dealing with trauma or even regret? Yeah, I mean, I, I think I always try to be completely transparent with our subjects and offer myself as openly to them as they do to me where appropriate. Like if it's some, if I'm talking to an academic about, you know, the value of the framing device and cannibal Holocaust, I'm not going to immediately be like, Oh, my dad died of cancer. Let's, let's bond here. But, um, there, there's a, <clears throat> I think there's a way to, just create a, 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 a an environment on the set um, that that kind of encourages an open dialogue, and a big part of that is not having a big crew is very important, keeping it intimate, but also just being two human beings talking to each other, not a, a you know film a director talking to a subject. Um, it's just a, it's a fine balance, you know, like I, I don't go in with any list of questions. I don't, you know, go in really, I'm prepared to a degree, but I'm also wanting to leave a lot open to discovery. And I think that helps because it, 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 it means that I'm genuinely curious in the moment. And I think that shows a little bit in, in the conversations and, and it brings stuff out from people and yeah i mean i might i just try to try to be because it's a it's ultimately a giving thing like they're giving a lot to you when when especially people are sharing very personal stories and you know you have to be grateful that they're willing to do that and and trust you to tell their story so i'm i'm just as happy to give back to them something from my life that might relate to what they're talking about and might encourage sort of a trust there. Um, so yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm glad it comes through, um, in the, uh, the show, but I think, uh, it, it's definitely, and, and after, you know, going through my own sort of, uh, my own loss a couple years ago, I, I don't know that it's specifically like inform the ability to talk to people about loss after that but it definitely gave like a, a point of connection that i could share with someone if we had that in common um there were there were there was one interview subject in particular that it didn't come up during the interview but after the interview we talked for some time about uh a, unexpected loss to cancer and it was you know it was, I think, a, 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 a good moment to, you know, we already did the interview, so it's not like it was like priming them to open up on camera, but at the very least, it, it was, I hope, hopefully it suggested that they're in good hands, you know? Right. And, and again, you know, not trying to get too personal, I, I really do appreciate you sharing that because I lost a, a stepnephew last year um, to a drug overdose, and I listened to that episode again, and it brought a little bit of comfort so I, I really do appreciate you know you being so transparent and and and, and sharing that and knowing that you know there are, everybody goes through something so horrible you know yeah. at some point or another I'm sorry to hear that yeah yeah it's tough um was it easier to get um people to 
sign on to be interview subjects, having that first season and sort of showing them, you know, what you had done originally, like a proof of concept, or was there still some convincing in terms of getting certain people that you wanted to uh, partake in, in the series? It was, it was easier for sure. I mean, the, the title does not do us any favors when it comes to approaching people about some more sensitive subject matter. But because we had the first season under our belt, we could show them like, this is how we handle these things. Like, this is what the show is. And even though this season, I think is a little bit different from the first, the general, you know, approach is similar. So yeah, I mean, that was definitely easier. There were still some people that either we couldn't find or really the biggest challenge was COVID. I mean, there were some people I wanted to talk to that ultimately we couldn't because of COVID. Um, right. Some people that just weren't comfortable at that time having a film crew, even in their backyard. So, which it makes sense, you know? So, so um, that was the biggest challenge. And I think we're, we're all just kind of really amazed and, and grateful that we got to make the show at all during the pandemic, let alone the number of interviews we did, the, the traveling we did. Um, it was all very stressful and logistic, uh, kind of logistically a, a bit of a nightmare. But um, I think it paid off because it just the, the this season feels a lot more international. Um, there's a bigger scope there. So um, I watch it back and I just think, wow, that we we somehow made that happen. <laughs> It right. was like 14 day quarantines. Every time we traveled, we would come back and have to do 14 day quarantines and sometimes do the hotel quarantine thing. Right. So it was it was a lot. Well, on, on top of that as well, um, you know, you, you, you talked about sort of, you know, shooting during COVID, but like, I mean, also shooting in places like Chernobyl and, and seeing all of these stray dogs. And I wanted to get your thoughts just on, on shooting on a location such as that, because again, you know, you've seen it in so many movies and, and newsreel footage. And how did that experience for you um, feel just being on the ground level? I loved that experience. Um, of course, you know, it, it's having, we filmed that last spring and we, we were in Kyiv and we, we went to Chernobyl. We were in uh, Tallinn in Estonia. So we went to Estonia first, then to Ukraine. And, you know, I, I was editing that episode. That's for the Stalker episode. I was editing that episode a month ago. Uh, bottlenecking? While bottlenecking, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, big time. While everything that's going on in Ukraine has been happening and it's just so horrible and surreal. Um, but you know, it, it, it was a, a great experience. Like Kiev was such a beautiful place to visit and Chernobyl was, it's really like a, a, a weirdly magical in like a maybe dark magic kind of way. The, the being able to walk around what used to be a town that now looks like a forest is is powerful because it shows how easily thing like as soon as you uh remove the human element just nature completely takes over and some of the things that we had to keep in you know uh, be mindful of like not putting they don't want you to put anything on the ground because of the soil being uh contaminated so that the first thing we did was pull our tripod out and you know, drop, put it on the ground and it's like, no, can't put that on the ground. So we had to put plastic wrap on all the tripod legs and we're all carrying backpacks with lenses and we couldn't put the backpack on the ground. And it was weird. It was like a, a, a weird, um, game of like the, the floor is lava or something. <laughs> like, right. Um, and, and, you know, just driving in a van through Chernobyl and then suddenly all of our uh, meters going off beeping because we've entered some area that's highly radioactive. That's surreal. And the tourist aspect of it is surreal. Having, uh, an ice cream place in Chernobyl is 
odd. <laughs> right. And and also, again, you know, I'm, I'm referencing Film Junk a lot, but you do talk about it as as you were kind of, you know, in the process of making the show. But you also talked about, you know, the tourist aspect of it, of, of kind of doing stuff that's on the books and off the books. Was there any anxiety or stress kind of doing any of those touristy kind of things that were off the books just in terms of like kind of, did it feel like you were doing something that like you could get in a lot of trouble for or just the idea of of things going wrong so we didn't really do much off the books because originally the plan was to follow to take the tour the official tour but then also go into the zone with a stalker um and you know do the whole illegal thing we didn't end up doing that because it was insane. <laughs> it was like, it just not, it was not feasible for a film crew because it would have required us to essentially stay up 24 hours and walk six hours into the zone and six hours out of the zone. And we weren't really comfortable with, you know, the, the sort of lack of guarantees that we wouldn't be entering areas that would be detrimental to our health. Um, so ultimately what we did is we found a stalker named Kirill who he's been doing this for years and he gave us footage, all the footage that he shot in the zone on his own adventures. And I use that for the episode and it's actually better. It, it's, I feel like there's like an, an immediacy to his footage and he's capturing real moments that feel a lot more inspired than I think it would have if we went in there with our camera following him. Um, so it made sense that we were documenting the more, you know, uh, controlled experience in Chernobyl, which in itself isn't that controlled either. <laughs> like, it, it's not that, you know, it, I would not, again, I would not recommend it for people who, who want like to take an easy vacation, but you know, that in contrast with his GoPro footage and like, you know, uh, prosumer, HD footage, I think, creates an interesting contrast visually. And, and speaking of footage, and, and you talked about having a small crew earlier, I wanted to ask you, does having that crew, whether it be someone to help you, you know, find archival footage or footage from other movies, take off some of the pressure or the stress when it comes to making those deadlines or giving suggestions for certain things. And I wanted to ask you specifically about um, the Wizard of Oz uh, episode. Was it you that was going through all that conspiracy like YouTube videos where the one like guy says like, oh, you know, he tried to debunk the Keanu Reeves being a reptile and that kind of stuff? Yeah, I mean, that that video I actually had <laughs> in the first season in one of the rough cuts before we knew we would end up doing a second season and talking about Wizard of Oz, I had a little section in one of the episodes that was just about conspiracies. And I had that clip in the first season and we ultimately cut it out, but I kind of set it aside and was like, this is going to be used at some point in something. So, um, but I mean, on top of that, there's, uh, I, I work with uh, Steph McCarroll, who is our visual producer and she, is amazing at finding, you know, if I'm doing a cut and I need something, I'll put a card in that says, you know, I need bullfighting images or video or film. And then she'll go looking and send me options. And there will be considerations in regards to quality, cost, um, all of those things. But, but it's, it does alleviate a lot of uh, stress, spending too much time just scouring, you know, uh, the internet for, for certain images and that, that I need to tell the story. But in, in terms of the film clips, that is a lot of that is me just rating my, my collection and, you know, getting to, uh, have fun with a little bit of a film history lesson in these episodes as well. Right. And, and again, it shows the, the, the playful side of, of, of you as a filmmaker. I, I know also looking at the, the, you know, the credits, um, I just wanted to ask how hands on are you with um, cinematography? Because again, like, you know, you are also a cinematographer, but there are other people working with you uh, in collaboration. And I wonder just like what that process is like, especially when, you know, you have, you know, certain deadlines to make. Uh so on this season, uh, Jared Rabb was our cinematographer and I worked with Jared on 
about half of the first season as well, and he's great. And it's really, I, I think, just talking about what the, the look of the show is, understanding the tone of the show, and Jared is is tapped into that and, and understands, I think, what my taste is and and you know i get his taste as well and i think we work together quite well so i mean a lot of it is just kind of entering a space talking about where to put the camera setting it down and then for me it's good because i can focus on the interview um and not worry about like ignoring a subject while i'm trying to set stuff up and and i wouldn't be able to do that anyways because my time as a cinematographer was out of kind of necessity doing these smaller documentaries and I and I would not call myself um a cinematographer in terms of like the 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 technical side of things I would not be comfortable being hired to work on someone else's film as a cinematographer it worked for me because I was shooting my first two films usually with a friend of mine or by myself so any embarrassing blunders I just swept under the rug because no one saw so <laughs> did how much um input like did did you shoot a lot of the um the reenactments and was it always meant to be on film so the reenactments we filmed with Mike McLaughlin who actually shot the other half of the first season uh and yeah well I, I always wanted it to be film just to separate out the the look of the recreations from everything else some of it was shot digitally and then transferred to film in cases where we had to do visual effects. Um, but yeah, it was, a, it was, I think, five days of pure recreation shooting. And that was in November, I think, uh, just this past November. So it was after we had filmed all of the documentary stuff. Right. And it's just so seamless. It reminded me a little bit of um, Sarah Pauly's stories we tell where some of it you you're not sure whether or not uh, it's actual, you know, behind the scenes footage from, you know, you know, making ofs or, or things like that. So it blends really well together. Yeah, I mean, I that's good to hear. I I, I don't like feeling like a, a recreation is just there as B-roll to cover edits in a talking head interview, you know, or animation and documentaries. Yeah. Yeah. Sometimes there's just a, it feels like a little bit of a band aid or like just an easy way to be able to, um, condense things and, you know, but with this, it was, I, the hope was to make something that felt like it was part of the story. And if we're recreating something, there's, there's some image in there that feels like it, it should be recreated like it uh, it is a strong image that uh deserves to be seen not just some you know like impressionistic shot of a clock on a wall or or whatever although i have done those before <laughs> um but uh yeah so the the i just wanted to be able to have fun with representing some of those stories on film right I have to wrap with you, but before I do, are you thinking about possibilities for season three now, or are you just kind of happy to, you know, indulge a little bit in the success of, of what the series ha is already and what it's doing right now? I mean, I, the, I think there, there are stories that could be told for a season three. Um, you know, if people respond positively to the second season, if there's like a, an openness to broadening the the perspective of what a curse film can mean um you know we've already brought in some horror adjacent films into this season i i know there's a some films that are not horror at all that have really interesting stories connected connected to them that i would love to um to cover but but at this point i'm basically just like ready to you know, I'm out of the bottlenecking. I'm ready to just <laughs> chill for a bit and we'll see what happens. I need ready, to watch some movies. Right. You're ready to watch them pop and duo uh, YouTube videos. Yeah. Yeah. Just relax with some Funko Pop unboxing videos and live my best life. That's awesome. Uh, it's always great getting to talk to you and, and, and watching your work. And I really do appreciate uh, you taking the time to do this. Thank you very much. Yeah. Thanks for doing it, Eric, especially with COVID. 
Yeah. Uh. You are a true hero. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's a wrap on this special mini episode of the Untitled Movie Podcast. Thank you to Jay Cheel for joining us. You guys should definitely go check out the Film Junk Podcast on all podcast services. And please go watch Curse Films too. It's fantastic. And now streaming on Shudder. Uh, go check out Eric's other work over on CinemaScene at rogerstv.com slash CinemaScene and follow him on all those social medias at EM6211. I'm Matt Rohrbeck, and until next time, peace.